Good evening. I'm Cindy Jordan, a member of the Board of Directors of the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. And I'd like to welcome you to our virtual Live from the Library program this evening, The Great Escape, Shackleton's Antarctic Adventure, Part One. I want to extend a special thanks to our live program sponsors, Friends of the Walnut Creek Library, Minuteman Press, and East Bay Times. This two-part program is about the Anglo-Irish Antarctic explorer, Ernest Shackleton, who set out with 27 men from South Georgia Island in the South Atlantic Ocean, intending to cross the Antarctic continent. But before he could land, his ship, the Endurance, was locked into the ice and eventually crushed. Tonight and tomorrow, we will hear about this amazing journey of perseverance and survival. I would like to welcome tonight's speaker, Mark Jordan, a lecturer with a passion for exploration and travel. And yes, he's my other half. Earlier this year, just before the pandemic, we traveled to Antarctica and South Georgia Island and spent time following some of Shackleton's footsteps, seeing many places made famous by this expedition. Mark teaches and lectures on many historic topics, including the Lewis and Clark expedition, and William Shakespeare at a number of venues, including the Walnut Creek Library, the Black Hawk Museum, and a variety of university locations through the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Earlier this year, Mark was awarded the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation's Meritorious Achievement Award for promotion and education of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. At the end of Mark's presentation, we will have time for a Q&A. If you have questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. One very important point, even though our libraries are closed, programs and activities like this one continue to thrive online and bring our community together. Now more than ever, the foundation needs your support to continue funding the broad range of free activities our libraries offer. I'll be back at the end of tonight's program to tell you how you can support our efforts. Meanwhile, welcome Mark. I'll now turn the spotlight over to you to take us on Shackleton's fascinating journey. So, <clears throat> so I need to get, I need to screen share, so just a second. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm glad you're all here this evening. Uh, for this great adventure. And thank you, Mrs. Jordan. It was a pleasure meeting you and preparing for this talk. Uh, Sir Ernest Shackleton was born in Ireland, but his physician father moved his family to England when he was a boy. After attending Dulwich College, he joined the Mar Maritime Marine because he could not afford to join the Royal Navy. He became a captain at, by the age of 19 and a master mariner by 25. In 1901, he petitioned to join uh, Robert Falcon Scott's attempt to reach the South Pole. And here you can see the Antarctic Peninsula and, uh, and the Antarctica. Here is roughly where the pole is. This is roughly where Scott's expedition started. Scott, Shackleton, and E.A. Wilson reached 82 degrees south, but they barely made it back. And here you can see Scott, Wilson, and Shackleton way back here, struggling to come back to their camp. Shackleton became quite ill on the return. Scott sent Shackleton home, purportedly due to illness. And although Shackleton had been ill, most authorities believe Scott resented Shackleton or did not like him. Having been bitten by the Antarctic bug in 1908 or 1909 and 1909, Shackleton went south again. He set out for the pole with Frank Wilde, a name we will be hearing often, and two other men. The four men reached 88 degrees, 30 minutes south, less than 100 miles from the pole. But Shackleton realized that if they added 200 miles, they would not make it back alive. Doing the smart thing, instead of the British thing, the four men made it back, but barely. Along the return, Shackleton saw Wilde was starving. Wilde remembered. Shackleton privately forced upon me his one breakfast biscuit and would have given me another tonight had I allowed him. I do not suppose that anyone else in the world can thoroughly realize how much generosity and sympathy I was shown by this, 
I do, and by God, I shall never forget. He became irrevocably loyal to Shackleton. Shackleton returned a hero and was knighted. Interestingly, some criticized Shackleton for abandoning the attempt, not really caring whether he made it back alive. He responded with, better a live donkey than a dead lion. He then learned that first Raoul Amundsen and then his former employer Scott had reached the pole. The difference, Amundsen made it there and back with relative ease and Scott killed himself and the four others with him. Scott instantly became a hero and Amundsen was considered an interloper. Shackleton had to find another Antarctic adventure. He created the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. And here you can see roughly what the plans were. He would pass from one side of the pole, if you can follow my little cursor across the screen, one side of the continent to the South Pole and out the other side of the continent, a very ambitious undertaking. He sought sponsors and men. He ran an advertisement. Men wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honors and recognition in case of success. Ernest Shackleton for Burlington Street. He received over 5,000 applications, including three from women. And let me read to you the letter uh, from, or part of the letter from the women. Dear Sir Ernest, we three sporty girls have decided to write and beg of you to take us with you on your expedition to the South Pole. We are three strong, healthy girls and also gay and bright and willing to undergo any hardships that you yourselves undergo. If our feminine garb is inconvenient, we should just love to don masculine attire and so on. Unfortunately, they weren't selected for the expedition. He purchased a ship that had originally been intended as a polar tourist boat named the Endurance. The ship was made of tremendously strong materials, planks of oak and Norwegian fir up to 30 inches thick and sheathed with greenheart, a wood intended to withstand the rigors of the Antarctic climate. Shackleton assembled his crew, most of his funding, and was about to depart in early August 1814, but a major event intervened, World War I. He offered his men to the British Armed Forces. He received a reply from the Admiralty, and Winston Churchill was First Lord of the Admiralty then, proceed. The monarchy and the government had blessed the expedition despite the war. The Endurance set out for Buenos Aires on August 8, 1914, while Shackleton and Wild remained in England to finish business. The Endurance was under the command of Frank Worsley. Apparently things were a little lax on the way across, so after his arrival in Buenos Aires, Shackleton could, took command and replaced a couple of troublesome crew members. Frank Hurley, an Australian with significant Antarctic experience, who was also an accomplished photographer, joined the expedition, and you will see a lot of Frank Hurley's work tonight. Thomas Ord Lees, one of the other members, said he is a brilliant photographic artist, beside being a most versatile handyman. And Worsley said he is a marvel with cheerful Australian profanity. He perambulates alone, aloft, and everywhere in the most dangerous and slippery places he can find, content and happy at all times, but cursing so if he can get a good or novel picture. So let me introduce you to some other members of the expedition. Tom Crean, he's second officer. He had been on a number of Antarctic expeditions and was heartbroken when Scott did not choose him to make the trip to the pole in 1911. Lucky Crean. Henry. Chippy McNish, the carpenter. He was one of the expedition savers. George Marston, brought along as the expedition artist. He, would been, he had been with Shackleton's Nimrod expedition. Leonard Hussey, the man who brought the banjo. And here you can see a postcard that Hussey wrote to his mom and dad just before they departed from South Georgia Island. Hope all are well, that the war is not upsetting you all too much. I wish I were there at the front, questionable. We are off tomorrow for good, so I'm afraid you'll hear no more or be able to write to me till our return about 1916. So remember, this is uh, late 1914. Love to yourselves in person, doll, from your affectionate son, Len. And of course, there is Pierce Blackborough, the stowaway. He had applied to join the endurance crew in Buenos Aires with a friend 
William Bakewell. Shackleton had accepted Bakewell, but turned Blackborough down. Black Bakewell smuggled Blackborough onto the Endurance. Blackborough was only discovered after they were several days at sea. An outrage Shackleton berated him, breaking up the tirade with, if we run out of food and anyone has to be eaten, you will be the first. Do you understand? Reportedly, Blackborough replied, they would get a lot more meat off you, sir. And of course, there's Mrs. Chippy, the carpenter's pet cat. The crew consisted of 28 men, each of whom would be tested as few have been tested. Unlike Scott, who rarely let the differing classes mix, Shackleton instituted a more egalitarian mingling of the expedition's members. Not everybody was happy with this. British snobbery dies hard after all, but it worked well in the end. And they had been joined by 69 Canadian sledging dogs. So they set out on October 26, 1914 for the Antarctic. Every man aboard the Endurance expected the war to be over before they reached their goal. They sailed from Buenos Aires to South Georgia, uh, South Georgia Island, and let me show you on the map here. You can see where they leave from Buenos Aires and flow over, over to here to South Georgia, stopping at Gritviken, a key whaling station. And here in the harbor, you can see the endurance at rest. You can see Worsley and Hudson up on the top of the mountain in the photo taken by Hurley. The Norwegian whalers gave them bad news. And uh, here you see another photo of Gritviken. The ice conditions were the worst they had been in years. Shackleton waited a month hanging around Gritviken. And here you can see a modern photograph of Gritviken taken earlier this year with all the storage tanks that were used for the whale byproducts in the lower right corner. You can see a whaling boat with the torpedo gun on the bow. During that layover, he visited the whaling station at Stromness, a portent of which he was completely unaware at the time. With no reported improvement in the ice situation, he could wait no longer. The endurance left the cumbers of Gritviken and headed south by southeast on December 5th. Now here you can see on the right, her, a Worsley with a semaphore signaling to who's ever steering the boat which direction they should go in. Now the photograph on the left was taken when I was heading to Antarctica earlier this year and this boat was returning Antarctica and it looks so much like the Endurance under sail, I just had to take a picture of it because we really don't have a photograph of the Endurance under sail. So that's probably pretty much what the Endurance was looking like when it was, when it was leaving for Antarctica. Their target was Vassal Bay. And here again, looking at the map, you can see the uh, approach to Antarctica. They're coming down, this is the Weddell Sea here. They're coming down the eastern uh, side of the Weddell Sea. Here is the uh, pole they're going to unload here. So they will, uh, the, the crossing team will unload, unload here and set up camp. The Endurance would return to South Georgia, the Falcons or Buenos Aires, while the Polar team would do all the work necessary to attempt the crossing. But the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition could not be accomplished with only the Endurance. Shackleton needed to have food depots laid on the other side of the pole. Shackleton arranged for a ship, the Aurora, to leave New Zealand, loaded with supplies and men capable of laying out the supplies. And again, you see here is where the Aurora would have landed, the lower part of the screen, and they would have laid depots out up towards the South Pole. The history of the Aurora is the forgotten story of the Shackleton expedition. Within two days, the ice made its surreal appearance, piling ice up against ice. The Endurance proceeded to the eastern side of the Weddell Sea, looking for open channels. Though they would occasionally smash into flows, no damage was done to the sturdy ship. Even when ice trapped the ship, the Endurance managed to push through or escape. At times, the engines would have to be cranked up. All day we have been utilizing the ship as a battering ram. When the ship comes in impact with the ice, she stops dead, shivering, then almost immediately a long crack starts from out of the bow into which we steam and like a wedge, slowly force the crack, Hurley. <clears throat> Other times, the men would get on the ice and chop it away, hoping to free the ship. They celebrated a jolly Christmas with turtle soup, white bait, a fish, jug hair, Christmas pudding, mince pies, dates, figs, and crystallized fruits with rum and stoutest drinks. 
At midnight on December 31st, the Scots contingent broke out into all Lang Syne, awakening the more so-called respectable members of the crew. In Ward Lees, one of those more respectable members, he believed, Scotchmen are always a nuisance at New Year and never have voices worth speaking of. By January 13th, the crew saw pressure packs in every direction. On the evening of the 14th, they neared land. Here it would have been possible to disembark, but Shackleton decided against it as it would have added too many miles to their attempt to reach the pole. On the 18th, after a gale forced them to hide behind a large iceberg, <clears throat> they moved to within 80 miles from Vassal Bay, less than a day's sail away. And here on the right, you see uh, an iceberg that was photographed by Hurley. And on the left, you see an iceberg that I photographed uh, earlier this year. The ice flows and the brash ice block the endurance. So, and here you see a photograph of brash ice. Brash ice is what you get when the ocean starts to freeze. It gets very sludgy until it, it uh, freezes into thick flows. On the 24th, they tried to break through a close lead. The full engine and sails, but the endurance could not breach it. And here you, here you see them trying to breach through to a lead. And you also see in uh, one of the logbooks kept by the men, uh, a, of course, a very detailed uh, log of what they were doing, but you can also see some of the icebergs that he drew while they were um, making progress. On the 27th, Shackleton told the men that they were most likely locked in the ice for the season. And Ordley's recorded that they were frozen like the almond, like an almond in the middle of a chocolate bar. Any chance of reaching Vossel Bay was gone. And keep in mind, this is the height of the Antarctic summer. So the endurance is unable to move in any direction. Now here you see a map of the Weddell Sea. Uh, they get trapped over here on the right side, uh, my, at least my right side of the screen. They get uh, trapped down here. The wet LC drifts in a, circu uh, a clockwise direction and the prevailing winds tend to push the ship in the same direction. So you get a rough idea of where they are and, and where they're going. Uh, as they remain locked in, in the wet LC, the current pushes them westward, pushes them northward, further away from land and further and further away from Vossel Bay. On the 14th, a lookout spotted a lead about a quarter of a mile away. The crew cut a path 150 yards long. The next morning, the ship tried to ram its way through, but failed against a flow over 12 feet thick. By February 24th, the men had accepted they would not be able to get free of the ice until October, November, December, which will be the spring and summer in the Southern Hemisphere. Shackleton personally assumed responsibility of keeping the men in good health and spirits through a polar winter. He had to swallow the bitter disappointment of another failure. Shackleton showed one of his sparks of real greatness. He did not rage at all or show outwardly the slightest sign of disappointment. He told us simply and calmly that we must winter in the pack, never lost his optimism and prepared for winter. Macklin, one of the physicians. To deal with the sleeping quarters, here you can see the crew, all but one early taking the photo. To deal with sleeping quarters that were bitterly cold, Shackleton had the carpenter, McNish, create comfortable quarters in the storage areas. By March 11th, McNish had finished what had became, what becomes known as the Ritz. Every Saturday night, Shackleton would distribute a ration of grog, a rum drink. They had a weekly toast as they raised their glasses. To our sweethearts and wives, may they never meet. Dog loose were built for the dogs, while Mrs. Chippy, the cat, had free run of the endurance. Shackleton and Wild divided the dogs into teams and encouraged races. Charles Green and the former stowaway Blackbow, Blackborough cooked ample food. And in this photograph on the left-hand side, you can see Blackborough with a huge chunk of ice that he's bringing into the kitchen that will be melted down for water. They enjoyed parties, slideshows, lectures, Hussey playing his banjo, the men shaving their heads. They had no way of contacting the world beyond the ice. Shackleton knew that the silences of perpetual night could have terrible effects on the men, so he implemented a strict routine. 
a different man took a watch each night. And here uh, on the right, you see a watchman returning from a watch uh, out on the skis. On the left, you've got several men sitting around the stove, keeping the night watchman company. And if you look closely at the spars and the masts and the ropes, you can see the rime ice beginning to form on, uh, on, on the ship, which is obviously quite cold. Hunting parties sought seals and penguins for meat and blubber, the latter which would also be used for food. In mid-April, the ice surrounding the endurance began to pinch it. Current and wind rammed floating hunks into each other, pushing them towards the skies, surrounding the endurance with mountains of ice. There you can see uh, one of Hurley's more imaginative photos. He had the ship illuminated at night and took the photograph at night, making it look like a ghost ship. <clears throat> the endurance had been built incredibly strong, but how strong? Stronger than the forces of nature? On May 1st, the temperature dropped to minus 17 degrees. The men filled their time with games, reading, arguing over what they read, played chess with Hurley tonight, and had a desperate game ending in a stalemate. We played in Hurley's dark room, which is cozy and warm. He has just finished developing about 3,000 feet of film. Now, I mean, that's two thirds of a mile. It's a, an enormous amount of film that was recorded by James. He's playing here with Leonard Hussey, the banjo man. Shackleton was always one of the boys, lending them his support and encouragement. That is Sir Ernest all over. He is always able to keep his troubles under and show a bold front. His unfailing cheeriness meant, uh, means a lot to a band of disappointed explorers. He never appears to be anything but the acme of good humor and hopefulness, or at least. Shackleton practiced relaxed discipline, and the men more willingly obeyed him for it. For example, here you see one of the instances of egalitarianism. The chief scientist is scrubbing the floor, the third officer is scrubbing the floor, and a physician is scrubbing the floor, something you would not see very often. He made sure the sailors were well cared for. They did not have to perform the routine duties expected of the other men. He had a motto, optimism is true moral courage. <clears throat> and he would reiterate this frequently over the next extended time. Some of the seamen lodged a complaint with Shackleton against John Vincent, physically the strongest of the men. They accused him of bullying. After a brief interview, the contents of which were unfortunately not recorded, there were no instances of bullying. The group, though quite heterogeneous, became a cohesive unit. And on the left, the photograph which you, that you see here is a means of setting up a rope that would lead to and away from the ship. So if the men were out and they're caught in a storm, they have a way of finding their way back to the ship. By the 30th of June, Worsley, an expert navigator, determined that they had drifted in the Weddell Current 670 miles, it meant that they might be able to reach the Antarctic Peninsula. And on the right, you, here you see Worsley and Hudson, who was also another navigator, uh, taking their readings and figuring out where they are. Here you see Green the cook, and here you see Blackborough the stowaway in something that resembles an almost complete igloo. Uh, they're cooking uh, outside so and to not endanger the ship. Here you, now here you see the Antarctic Peninsula. Okay, so this is the Weddell Sea over here. And they're floating somewhere around in here in the Weddell Sea. Uh, they're looking to get up into this area up here in the upper right of the uh, Palmer Peninsula, the Antarctic Peninsula. And just so you know, the photograph on the right was taken uh, coming out of Marguerite Bay just down in this area here. At all hours of the day or night, Hurley roamed the ship. Uh, magically capturing some of the most incredible images ever seen of Antarctica. You can see him up on the one of the spars, sitting down taking a photograph of uh, Shackleton. And here again, you see him with both his movie camera and his, uh, his regular camera. Uh, he hung his plates to, to dry in the warmth of Shackleton's cabin. And there you see Shackleton's cabin and Hurley logged this complaint. Development is a source of annoyance to the fingers which split and crack around the nails in a painful manner. During June, colliding ice piled huge blocks about the flow. 
At times during the night, a distant, rich, deep booming note is heard, changing at times to a long creaking groan, which seems to carry a menacing tone. Worsley. The noise ceased, but left cruel reminders. A midwinter celebration allowed them to engage in distracting hijinks. From within the confines of the Ritz, it is hard to imagine we are drifting frozen and solid in a pack of sea ice in the heart of the Weddell Sea. I wonder what is to become of it all early. By the end of June, they had drifted almost 700 miles. With the sun appearing soon, they should be, they hoped, free from the ice. But on June 13th, they're struck by a blizzard. Flows collided against the endurance. The valiant ship quivered. So did the men. It was making just the sort of sound that you would expect a human being to utter if he were in fear of being murdered. Worsley. And Shackleton recorded, what the ice gets, the ice keeps. And the temperature at this time was minus 34 degrees. On July 21st, Worsley observed a crack in an adjacent flow. The men readied, but the breakup failed to materialize, and they had to remove shifting blocks of ice from the rudder. Throughout August, the endurance remained locked in place. But on the 2nd of September, repeated increased pressure squeezed the ship. The ship literally jumped into the air and settled on its beam. Bakewell. The men exhibited varying degrees of concern, while Shackleton did everything in his power to assuage the concern while preparing for the worst. And yet, once again, the pressure relented. She shows almost unconceivable strength. Every moment it seems as though the flow must crush her like a nutshell. The behavior of our ship in the ice has been magnificent. Undoubtedly, she is the finest little vessel ever built. The men would play on the ice. The members of the staff and crew took advantage of the pause to enjoy a vigorously contested game of football on the level surface of the flow alongside the ship. Shackleton. They would exercise the dogs or they would hunt when they could. With spring, a penguin and a seal appeared. Fresh meat, mm, yum. Perhaps too, the ice would relent. On October 14th, the flow began to split. While the endurance lay in a pool of open water, Shackleton had the men try to move it. The ice was too thick and too stubborn. Then on the 18th, Colossal pressure forced the endurance to list 30 degrees to port. The endurance remained in this position for several hours. Hoping the ice would split into a lead, the men fired up the boilers. But alas, the endurance remained fast. Threateningly, killer whales cruised the seams near the ship. Now they knew that killer whales hunted seals and that they would either jump on the ice or break through the ice to capture them. And the men were afraid that the killer whales, the orca, would mistake the men for seals and come through the ice. They, they maintained a strip for the whole time, but it never happened. On October 4th, the men saw the endurance twisted between three blocks of ice. The endurance began to leak. Water rushed in before, and before pumps could flush it out. McNish went below and built a coffer dam standing in water up to his waist now. This water is roughly 30 degrees. Others feverishly moved the supplies, food, necessary materials off the ship onto the adjoining ice. McNish stemmed the flood, but the ship was still under intense pressure. Shackleton had the boats, there are three whalers or cutters on there, the Dudley Docker, the James Caird, and the Stancombe Wills. Had the three boats taken to the ice, they'll play an important role in the future. The work was furious, strenuous, and cold. That night, the men on deck observed a group of penguins walking by, uttering uh, an eerie, soulful cry. Words of this particularly struck. I never, neither before or since, heard them make any sound so similar to the sinister wailings they moaned that day. The superstitious Seaman McLeod probably echoed what the other men thought. Do you hear that? 
Will none of us get back to our homes again? The ice knocked the stern upwards, ripping away the rudder, then lifting and dropping the endurance. The decks broke upward, ripping the keel, ripping the keel out. The endurance convulsed, the masts whipped back and forth. Now we're gonna interrupt this to show you a video that a Hurley captured of the ship beginning to break up. Okay, so uh, that's a uh, that's part of a video. There's actually a, a full film that Hurley made, roughly 90 minutes, that's available on YouTube. Here you can see Shackleton with one of the other men looking at the ship as it's in its pretty badly wrecked state. Shackleton gave the painful order to abandon ship on October 27th. The men evacuated supplies quickly, deliberately laying them on a supposedly solid ice floe. They dumped the gear about, then set up tents and crawled, flopping upon their sleeping bags without regard to the snow beneath them. They cared for nothing but sleep. They lovingly named this site Dump Camp. <clears throat> the ship never ceased its clamor. I do not think I have ever had such a horrible, sickening sensation of fear as I had whilst in the hold of that breaking ship, Macklin. Within an hour, the ice crushed the endurance side. We are homeless and adrift on the sea ice. Early. Could Shackleton foresee the coming physical and emotional demands they would face? For as bad as their situation was, things would only get worse. A home on the ice. Like Amundsen, Shackleton had brought reindeer sleeping bags intended for the wintering party, the cross transcontinental crossing party, which were warmer than the normal British canvas bags. Without enough reindeer sleeping bags to supply each of the 28 men, Shackleton held a lottery. By chance, each of the able seamen got the warmer bags, Shackleton doing his best to stem descent. As they slept that night, Shackleton, who had been walking the campsite, felt the ice crack. He immediately woke each man, forcing them to move the tents. They had to move two more times that night as a result of cracks. Shackleton then announced that it would begin a march with two of the boats that James cared in the Dudley Docker to find open water. The nearest known place offering food, shelter, and solid ground was Paulette Island. Now here you can see uh, roughly where the ship was, the blue spot, and Paulette Island up here at the tip of the peninsula. It's 350 miles away. Without emotion, melodrama, or excitement, Shackleton said, ships and stores have gone, so now we'll go home, Macklin. They were allowed to retain the clothes they wore, two pairs of mittens, six pairs of socks, two pairs of boots, a sleeping bag, and a pound of tobacco. Shackleton allowed each man only two pounds of personal possessions, though Shackleton allowed Hussey to bring his banjo. Shackleton needed Hussey's playing to, and singing to keep up morale. No personal article outweighed their personal survival. They had to be ruthless to survive. Shackleton knew that those overladen with equipment did not fare as well as those who were prepared for speed. McNish rigged slid sledges. Boat and sledge and gear loaded into the boat would exceed 1,000 pounds and maybe as much as 2,000 pounds. The terrain could never be described as a groomed surface. Before they set out, Shackleton wrote, I pray God I can manage to get the whole party safe to civilization. On October 30th, Shackleton, Hudson, World, Hurley, and Wordy led the laden sledges breaking trail. And here you can see an artist's rendition of what pulling the sleds were like. In the photo on the right, right, you can see the men all hooked up trying to move the cared over the very difficult ice. 
Now, before they left, Cream shot the puppies. Yes, the dogs had puppies. And also Mrs. Chippy the cat. Well, some of the other dogs were shot by their leaders. Not all the dogs were shot. For McNish, ferociously, ferociously attached to his cat, resented Shackleton's decision, feeling the cat would not need that much food to survive. Pressure ridges interrupted progress every several hundred yards. You can imagine what it was like to try to move heavy loads through that. The exhausted men made one mile the first day, only 349 more to go. They moved half a mile on the 31st and then a quarter of a mile on November 1st. Shackleton, Wilde, Worsley, and Hurley decided to stop to await the inevitable breakup of the ice. If the pack drifted as Shackleton hoped, it would take them near a well-provisioned hut on Paulet Island. They named this new site Ocean Camp. Supplies would be brought over from Dump Camp. Here you can see a couple of tents and on the photo on the right, you can see how they built a lookout to look for opening of leads. McNish broke through the deck of the endurance, allowing the retrieval of three tons of food, salvaging whatever they thought might be useful to survival. They returned with a third ship, a third boat to Stancombe Wills. The camp consisted of five tents, Shackleton, a leader in one, Wild in one, Crean in one, Worsley in one, and the seamen were in their own tent. Now, Hurley, having left much of his photographic gear behind, went back to retrieve them from the dying endurance. I hacked through the thick walls of the refrigerator to retrieve the negatives stored therein. They were located beneath four feet of mushy ice, and by stripping to the waist and diving under, I hauled them out. That's a pretty hardy rescue. Again, the water temperature is 30 degrees. Now, Shackleton was not terribly happy about Hurley grabbing this extra weight, but he and Hurley agreed that at least some of the material could be kept. Shackleton saw some value in it. Hurley and Shackleton agreed to save 120 of the negatives. They destroyed 400, and every time I say that, my skin crawls. What a loss. So Ernest rigid daily routine, had breakfast at eight, then the men set out to scout for seals or do camp work, lunch at one, afternoons at leisure, at 5.30 they ate hoosh. Hoosh is a stew, mostly of penguin or seal, with biscuits thrown in, and they drank cocoa. Afterwards, they got into their sleeping bags, where men served, and the men also served watches of an hour each. Since food supplies had to be watched closely, Shackleton, taking account of what was available, and what they might be able to get by hunting, limited each food to one pound per man per day, which was under the circumstances adequate. He knew the situation was desperate, but never once hinted at that. Morale, optimism outweighed practicality. He took every step he could to maintain optimism. He was prepared to go to any length to keep the party close knit. He had McNish retrofit the three boats. Not only in building the boat up one foot higher and decking her and halfway making her fit to carry the whole party in case we have to make a longer journey than we anticipated present, McNish recorded. He worked the other two boats as well, uh, increasing their height by a straight. You can see how he's uh, bringing the height of the cared up a good foot there. On November 21st, Shackleton on watch shouted, she's gone boys. The men rushed out of their tents to observe the endurance stern rise 20 feet in the air then slowly sink between, up beneath the ice that had crushed her. Ensconced on their, camp, uh, on their campsite flow, they continued to rely on the current of the wet LC to deliver them. Opinions were mixed. This is typical. Really, this sort of life has its attractions. I read somewhere that all a man needs to be happy is a full stomach and warmth. I begin to think it is nearly true. No worries, no trains, no letters to answer, no collars to wear. But I wonder which of us would not jump at the chance to change it all tomorrow, Macklin. Mid-December summer had failed to break up the ice. Shackleton became fearful he might lose his grip on the men if he failed to get them to a safe haven. He worried that the Weddell Sea Drift might push them away from the Antarctic Peninsula. On December 20th, he took Wild and Hurley to search for a route that might allow them to leave the flow. 
Wilde wrote, a spell of hard work would do everybody good. And this would prove to be an unfortunately over-optimistic op over assessment. December 23rd, after having celebrated Christmas the day before, they set out leaving the Stankham Hills behind, but made only one and one half miles. You can see why under this terrain. Shackleton felt two boats would be enough to carry all the men if they reached water. One might question whether these two boats could be capable of carrying 14 men each. McNish almost certainly did not think so, and many of the other men were not optimistic about the move. As far as I have, as far as I have seen, the going will be awful. In my opinion, it would be a measure to be taken only as a last resort, and I sincerely hope he will give the idea up directly. There have been great arguments about the matter in our tent. Green Street, first officer. And Worsley wrote, my idea is to stay here unless the drift should become large to the east, in other words, pushing them away from land. The men never allowed Shackleton to hear those opinions. They hold the next three days, making virtually no progress, maybe a mile a day. They slipped in the slush or broke through the crust into pools of freezing water, yet Shackleton persisted. McNish saw the boats being damaged. He said to Bakewell, if we had to go over much more of such rough ice, the boats would not float when they did reach open water, an assessment that was almost certainly correct. Finally, on December 27th, after yet another frustratingly unsuccessful slog, McNish confronted Worsley, asserting that the law of the sea required him to follow orders only as far as the ship existed. Worsley was unable to handle McNish's challenge. Shackleton came back and argued with McNish, then told all the men that their contract required everyone to go on regardless of the status of the ship. McNish backed down. Interestingly, this interaction was later cut from the ship's log. Interestingly, neither Worsley nor McNish recorded this episode in their diaries. Here you can see McNish's diary. And if you look at for the December 27th, we started at nine o'clock last night and done two miles and camped at 5 a.m. And he then has some description, then goes, we have had very rough going today. And that's it. Shackleton in his book South says only, the first 200 yards took us about five hours to cross, owing to the amount of breaking down of pressure ridges and filling in of leads that was required. Now you can imagine what the men felt like making 200 yards in five hours. Wow. Well, Worsley's reaction was typical of Worsley. He's not a great leader of men. We can also say that Shackleton reacted poorly, most likely because he knew McNish was correct. And because he sensed others felt the same way, this dented his ego and his attempt to convey optimism. The situation could have been easily diffused. What was McNish going to do if Shackleton had said, all right, you may stay here and fend for yourself, the rest of us will go on. McNish had nowhere to go. Shackleton used his self-assessment of his own poor decision to lash out at a convenient scapegoat, one who would continue to ensure their survival. Then two days later, after having totaled eight miles in seven days, Shackleton called a halt. McNish was right. It was insane to go on. Shackleton never admitted this, but clearly McNish's revolt had the effect of ending what would have been fruitless, disheartening, and potentially damaging work. But Shackleton could not let it go. I do not like retreating, but prudence demands this course. Everyone working well except the carpenter. I shall never forget him in this time of stress and strain. They set up another camp. On December 30th, the flow split. They moved again, not far, to what would be known as Patience Camp. McNish, perhaps with a perverse sense of satisfaction, repaired the damage to the boats. Wordy Riley noted, the boss has changed his mind yet once again. He now intends waiting for leads and just as firmly believes he will get them as he did a week ago that the ice would be fit for sledging the boats at the rate of 10 miles a day. Where he doesn't think much of Shackleton's optimism. Shackleton made other strange choices too. When asked if they could kill more penguins to lay up a store of food, he refused. He reasoned that if they laid up the food, the men would get the wrong message. 
rather foolish, as things have not turned out at all as he has estimated, and it is best to be prepared for the possible chance of having to winter here, Green Street. Then Shackleton decided that more dogs needed to be shot, as they could not be fed with existing supplies. Some of the men disguised their outrage. The present shortage of food is due simply and solely from the boss refusing to get seals when they were to be had, and even refusing Ord Lees to go out and look for them. His sublime optimism all the way through being, to my mind, absolute foolishness. Green Street again. And then when Ord Lees killed three seals, Shackleton would not permit him to bring them to camp. On January 14th, Wilde shot the dogs. This duty fell upon me and it was the worst job I ever had in my life. I have known many men I would rather shoot than the worst of the dogs, Wilde. And McNish, who just lost his cat, recorded one of the saddest events since we left home. On the 15th, Curly and Macklin, using some of the remaining dogs, brought back supplies from Ocean Camp, including canned vegetables, tapioca, I love tapioca, dog pemmican, and jam. The following day, Curly's dogs were shot. Hail to thee, old leader Shakespeare. I shall ever remember thee, fearless, faithful, and diligent, Curly. Only Macklin's team remained. A blizzard on the 21st pushed them north of the Antarctic Circle. Further explorations demonstrated that the ice had refused to break apart. The men returned to Ocean Camp to bring up the Stankham Wills. And as if to punish him for his inexplicable refusal to gather a store of penguin meat, Shackleton was forced to order the men to scour the refuse pile of dead penguins and seals. Stewed penguin hearts, liver eyes, tongues, toes, and God knows what else with a cup of water. I don't think any of us will have nightmares from overeating. McNish. The refusal to allow, have allowed hunting even angered the placid Worsley. On February 17th, after a period of slack rations, they discovered a flock of Adelie penguins, and they killed 300. Overjoyed men gobbled up the fresh meat. On March 3rd, Worsley reported they were 70 miles from Paulette Island. And here, looking at the map, the green line you see on the map is the rough drift of the, uh, of the flow that they're on. Here is Paulette Island over here. So they're roughly 70 miles away, but there were no leaves. And even if leaves appeared, the boats probably would have been crushed by the se uh, barely separated ice flows when they came together, which they did frequently. Ultimately, the Weddell Sea current pushed their frozen pallet past Paulet Island. But on March 9th, they felt swells from an open sea. The flow began to rock. They waited, but no breakup. They were drifting past the tip of the Paul Palmer Peninsula, which you see here. No one dared show despair or concern before Shackleton. But their hunger began to overwhelm them, with supplies so low that normal rations had long since been abandoned. On March 23rd, they spotted land, Joinville Island, up here just above Paulette Island, uh, only 57 miles away, with Paulette Island not far beyond it. If only the ice would break up. They waited impatiently, but as the men looked about, they saw massive bergs all pressing against the pack. On March 31st, their flow split. The men rushed about securing what they could, pulling supplies and food to their side of the split. <clears throat> Fortunately, Wilde shot a leopard seal, yielding a thousand pounds of fresh meat and a large supply of blubber. And to make their meals even more interesting, when they cut the belly open, they pulled out 50 pounds of undigested fish, which they cooked the following day and had a very uh, enjoyable fish dinner. On March 30th, Shackleton ordered that Macklin's dogs had to go. Wilde shot each dog, then Macklin skinned and gutted the carcasses, more fresh meat. Uh, it's not the first time dogs have been eaten on expeditions, by the way. They rode a diminishing flow. The men stayed on constant watch, four hours on and four off, as everyone felt the swelling sea destabilizing the flow. Then on April 7th, they first saw Clarence Island, and then shortly afterwards, Elephant Island land. Worsley measured the distance, only 50 miles. 
If only they could put <clears throat> put the three boats into the water. They might get to one of these presumed paradises. The wind drove their flow towards the two masses, but then it veered perversely west, pushing it away, then east, again, pushing it away. On the 8th, the flow split again, just under the James cared. Several of the men grabbed hold of the gunnels, struggling to pull it onto their flow, now only a triangle 100 with 100 yard sides. On the 9th, open water appeared alongside their flow. The flow could no longer support them. Just before 1 p.m., Shackleton sent the boats into the water. And here you can see a, a Mar Marston painting of the boats uh, following these very narrow leads. Shackleton kept wild with him, the James cared. Worsley manned the Dudley Docker, and the Stancombe Wills, the ever reliable Tom Crean, coordinated with Hudson, the other navigator. In a heavy swell, they carefully navigated between the floating ice mounds. Our first day in the water was one of the coldest and most dangerous of the expedition. The ice was running riot. It was a hard race to keep our boats in the open leads. We had many narrow escapes from being crushed when the larger masses of the pack would come together. Bakewell. A tide rip pursued them for a while, ice churning earnestly toward the three boats. At the head of an ice tongue that nearly closed the gap was a wave-worn berg shaped like some curious antediluvian monster, an icy Cerberus guarding the way, Shackleton. The men pulled at the oars, narrowly avoiding colliding with the mass. They found a flow 200 feet by 100 feet. Restless as ever, and here you see another Marston painting, restless as ever, I started to walk across the flows in order to warn the watchman to look carefully for the cracks. As I was passing the, uh, the men's tent, the flow lifted on the crest of a swell and cracked right under my feet, Shackleton. How and Holness dropped into the water. How managed to quickly drag himself back onto the flow, but Shackleton had to heave Holness's sleeping bag onto the ice just before the two trunks collided. Shortly after, it split, leaving the cared on the other side. Several men jumped the crack and pushed the cared over. Each man jumped back. When it was Shackleton's turn to jump, the crack was too large. In the dark, they put the Stankham wheels in the water and rode to Shackleton and transported him back. On April 10th, they finally slipped into open ocean. Another Marston painting, and you can see Ma uh, Shackleton's diary of the, of, the day, of the day, April 10th. Their meat-only diet quickly weakened their efforts to propel the boats. When night came, they tried to rest in the boats to little avail. They reached a flow 20 yards wide. By the time they had secured the boats, their hands were blistered and frostbitten. In the gale force wind, pack ice advanced towards them. The flow on which they camped was being eaten by waves, ice and wind, and Shackleton climbed a snow mound. Another Marston painting, nothing looked encouraging. Late in the afternoon, a lead opened. Shackleton shouted, launch the boats. The men dropped the boats into the water, the supplies into the boats, and they jumped in. They navigated towards Clarence Island, and here you can see the map. You can see well, Clarence Island is up on the upper right, and Elephant Island right next to it. You can see the rough position of the boat over here. You also see King George Island over here. They pulled alongside a flow. It was too unstable. The men slept in the boats, holding on to the flow. What misery that must have been. Green the cook took the stove onto the flow to provide the men something hot. They shivered all night, surrounded by snorting killer whales, still terrified that they might be eaten. When Worsley checked their position on the 12th, they had not advanced one mile. On the 13th, ice, ice sheathed each of the boats. At minus four degrees, the men's clothes were frozen stiff. They took hatchets to chop the ice off the boats. Many of the men were failing, unable to hold an oar. Some embraced to keep warm. Their lips were cracked, and their eyes and eyelids showed red in their salt and crusted faces. Shackleton. Each man suffered from thirst, and though none would have admitted it to Sir Ernest from profound despair. Despite this, they managed to arrive within 10 miles of Elephant Island. 
The six helmsmen, Shackleton and Wilde, Queen and Hudson, Worsley and Greenstreet, had been at the helm of their respective boats for three straight nights. A storm broke. The men feverishly bailed the boats. Shackleton, afraid of losing the stank from Wills, tied its painter, the, the, the rope on the bow, to the care. They had no fresh water, having forgotten to collect ice before fleeing from their last flow. Their mouths and tongues burned from the thirst and the terrible taste of splashing salt water. Then on April 15th, in a squall of snow, the Dudley Docker disappeared. Shackleton had no choice but to drive the James Caird and the Stancomb Wills toward the cliffs of Elephant Island. Ward Lees noted this of Shackleton. Practically ever since we first started, Sir Ernest had been standing erect day and night on the stern counter of the Caird. How he stood the incessant vigil and exposure is marvelous. Incredible endurance, if you'll pardon the pun. Shackleton found a narrow beach. Finally, after 170 days on ice floes and seven days crammed into three small boats, land. Shackleton moved into the Stankham Wills to line it up for a landing. Meanwhile, the wind had sho uh, shoved the missing Dudley Docker far away from the care. Worsley at the helm for almost 80 hours began to fall asleep, so Macklin went to replace him. Worsley had to be unwound and his body massaged before he could move. During the night, Green Street and Macklin steered by a small pocket compass using matches. They had no idea what happened to the Cairns, the Stank and Wills, and feared they had sailed past Elephant Island into the dangerous Drake Passage. But as morning's light began to spread over the horizon, before them lay Elephant Island less than a mile away. Just then they were struck by one of the catabatic winds that flew off the island. They needed Worsley, but he was dead asleep. McLeod kicked him several times in the head to waken him. He sat up and immediately had them raise the sail as waves hit the docker, filling it with water. Each man bailed as fast as he could. Worsley continued the docker along the coast, passing a narrow spit of land. They looked ahead. Shackleton prepared the Stankham Wills to shoot through the reefs when Worsley and the docker appeared. Greatly relieved, he guided the Wills to the beach. Shackleton wanted to give the honor of the first to land to Blackborough but his feet had been frostbitten. His boatmates lifted him onto the shore where he collapsed. They carried him up the beach. They found a glacier, fresh water. The men drank their fill. Green made some hot milk. The men warmed themselves around the stove. They killed four seals and had a nourishing meal of seal steak, then crawled into their damp sleeping bags. Turned in and slept as we had never slept before, absolute dead, dreamless sleep, oblivious of wet sleeping bags, lulled by the croaking of penguins. James. How delicious to wake in one's sleep and listen to the chanting of the penguins mingling with the music of the sea to fall asleep and awaken again and feel this is real. We have reached the land. Curly. What should have been unabated joy was tempered when Wilde pointed out to Shackleton that the beach was below the high water mark. Wild, Tom Crean, Marston Vincent, and Tim McCarthy took the Dudley Docker for an exploratory along the island's coast. Those who remained paced the beach, enjoying the comforts of terra firma under their feet. Some of the men were reeling about the beach as if they had found an unlimited supply of alcoholic liver on the desolate island, Shackleton. Many suffered from temporary aberration walking aimlessly about, shivering with palsy. You can imagine how they must have felt at this particular point in time. Wild and Crean returned late, reporting having found a suitable spot seven miles to the west. On April 17th, they moved to this rocky point, now known as Cape Wild, unloaded the boats and set up the tents on a rise above the high water mark. And here you can see the, uh, the, the spit where they're on. Here's the Caird, the Docker, the Stancom Wills, the men are pushing uh, the, the carrot up as far as they can. You can see where they've unloaded. And here you can see probably poor old Blackborough sitting there in agony, probably saying, such a wild and inhospitable place I have never beheld. Here you can see Cape Wild today. You can see the spit of land no longer exists. It's been washed away by the sea. But you can see a map drawn by James over here, which has a diagram of <clears throat> the spit of land they're on. 
They configured the camp as best they could, but rest, full, complete, uninterrupted rest, was the men's primary interest. The boss is wonderful, cheering everyone and far more active than any other person in the camp. At least there was food, seals and penguins, and by, and by inserting their hands into the fresh warmth of a dead seal's or penguin's body, they were able to ward off cold and cold and incipient frostbite. Except for Blackborough, with his frostbitten feet, and Rickinson, who had served a mild heart attack, the men recovered from the severe beating they had taken. The two physicians, Macklin and McElroy, treated the patients. Some of the seamen resisted attempts to get them to participate in the survival routine. <clears throat> Some of the party had become despondent in the more uh, what's the use sort of mood and had to be driven to work none too gently either. Wild. Dejected men were dragged from their bags and set to work. Wordy. It is regrettable to state that many conducted themselves in a manner unworthy of gentlemen and British sailors. Early. So one may wonder if this is a fair assessment. The sailors had just had expected to spend the last half year in Buenos Aires or certainly a better place than where they were. They had just experienced one of the worst seven days any sailor could imagine. It should have been no wonder that these individuals who had struggled mightily to save each other might want and deserve a rest. But it's also understandable that the men needed to be encouraged to survive. Shackleton, Wilde, and Worsley conferred on their predicament. Elephant Island was not within any known sea lane, nor could they take the three bo boats to any place of rescue. Several men would have to undertake a sea voyage. So here you see a map of the area. Here you see Elephant Island in the dead center. Cape Horn was the closest over here. The Falklands were the next closest, both roughly 500 miles away, but neither was reachable under prevailing sea currents and winds which ran in this direction. That left South Georgia Island. But it lay within prevailing winds and currents but the island was 800 miles away. They would have to find the whaling stations on the east coast of the island over here. Locating its narrow northern tip over here, you can see it along the way, over here, locating its narrow northern tip on the open Antarctic Ocean would be harder than locating a needle in the haystack. They had only a sextant, a compass, and a chronometer. Despite these almost overwhelming difficulties, Six men would take the James Cairn across the most treacherous seas on earth, hoping to hit a minuscule target. And that's it for today. What happens, we'll have to wait till tomorrow to find out. Uh, it's the great adventure continues and gets even more exciting. So now we'll turn it over to Cindy, who will pro ask questions that I hope I can answer. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, so we have a few questions in the Q&A box. Uh, here's one. What did they burn for fuel while on the ice flows? Well, while they were on the ice flows, the, the fuel they burned, oh, and once the ship was down, they burned blubber. Uh, the blubber, you know, the fat layers on, on the seals, and, and uh, they, there was some on the penguins, but mostly on the seals. And that was their primary source of fuel. When they were at or near the ship, they could burn, they could burn coal or wood. But once the ship went down, that was all gone. OK. And another question, would the Weddell Sea be free of ice today, given climate change? Big parts of the Weddell Sea are probably free of, of ice. Uh, in, in the summertime, it probably freezes somewhat in the wintertime. I, I didn't get to see much of the Weddell Sea. What I saw was at the northern end of the Weddell Sea, and uh, except for like a lot of the bergs uh, that uh, were in the presentation that I or that I included in the presentation, there was no ice that far north. There was ice thickening further south, and probably as you got closer to, uh, to land, uh, it probably was fairly icy, but climate change is really obvious in in the Antarctic. And I'll show you something tomorrow 
uh, to just to give you an idea of how much uh, climate change is impacted, what Shackleton and the men saw. Uh, here's a question. Has anyone tried to raise the endurance or at least try to find it? Uh, the it, it, Unfortunately, it's not like the Titanic. It didn't go down, at least in, in two solid pieces. Yes, Cambridge University, which has this, the, the Polar Institute there, went out, I think it was roughly five years ago, to try and find it because Worsley was an incredibly accurate keeper of latitude and longitude. And so they know roughly where it went down, but there's no way, they, they couldn't find it. And of course, there's no way of knowing what might have covered it or how much the, the wet LC current might have moved it. Uh, so, but yes, there was an effort made to find it. Okay, what about ultraviolet radiation in Antarctica? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, I, I assume there's plenty of it. I, there's, I mean, the hole in the ozone layer floats around there. Uh, I don't necessarily know that I saw it. I haven't looked at, I think you'd have to look at some of the client science uh, studies in order to get a complete answer to that, but I, I don't have an answer to that. Why do you think the men didn't commute commit mutiny and take over from Shackleton? Uh, uh, <clears throat> I, th I think to a man, they had this an enormous amount of respect for him. He had two previous Antarctic experiences. Uh, he was incredibly embarrassed. He treated the men on the ship incredibly well. So that they trusted him even uh, there there are men on the ship who were not necessarily jumping for joy over Shackleton or some of the things that he did, but there's nothing to indicate that in any way they didn't respect him. They didn't necessarily respect all the decisions. If you mutinied, what were you going to do? What could you possibly do? Uh, you got nowhere to go. It's like McNish saying, I'm not going any further. If Shackleton had gone on, McNish would have been left alone and had to fend for himself. Uh, the, the, the unit was really cohesive, uh, and I think they, they trusted him enough, and they trusted the few other men with him who had really significant Antarctic experience, which would be Wilde and Hurley and Cream, and that the, these guys are so loyal to Shackleton that anything remotely resembling a mutiny would have been put down instantaneously. I, I just They trusted him so much that they felt comfortable following him, even when what he did was not necessarily... Uh, in, in everybody's best interest. All right, here, here are two questions that I'll, I'll put together. Um, was the summer of Shackleton's expedition particularly cold, along with did Shackleton have any idea that his ship could have been trapped by the ice and sink? Was it totally unforeseen? Uh, the, the answer to the first question is that when they got to South Georgia. Uh, the answer, the initial answer is yes, it was a particularly terrible year for ice. And when he got to Grit Vic and, and spoke to the whalers who were down there, they told him that the ice was the worst they had seen in years. Now keep in mind, Shackleton had been down the Antarctic uh, 12 years before and, 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 and six years before and was able to get in. Whereas here, ice appears at the 57th parallel, which is pretty far north and much further north than Shackleton expected. And as he got towards the 60th parallel, I mean, it was ice everywhere. So it was much, much more ice than they ever anticipated. Now, the ship itself, the, the Endurance was called the, sh the second best polar ship ever built. For those of you who know Nansen and Amundsen, you know that they used a ship called the Fram. And the Fram was the strongest polar ship ever built. The Fram had an advantage that the Endurance didn't have, and that is the Fram was rounded, a really rounded bottom. So when the ice pinched the Fram, all the Fram did was go up. 
the endurance had a normal hole configuration. It was made of incredibly strong materials. No one would have expected that these materials would have been as badly impacted by it. And I think Shackleton reasonably believed that if the ice pinched it, it would raise the boat, the ship. So the answer, there's no expectation that the ship was going to be crushed. And there was a reasonable expectation that it would probably be a lot like the Fromm because it was made by the same shipbuilding company that made the Fromm. Now, originally the Endurance was built as a polar tourist boat. Uh, the company that wanted it built were going to take tourists, like we did earlier this year, down or up to the Antarctic or the Ar Arctic, and the boat would be reasonably safe even if it was in the ice. I, like I said, I don't think anybody anticipated that a boat this strong would have been crushed. But then, of course, nobody expected the Titanic to go down either. Why couldn't Shackleton afford to join the Royal Navy? Did seamen have to buy their way in? The, the Royal Navy was, uh, if you wanted to be an officer in the Royal Navy, you basically had to buy your way in. It was called Gentleman's Club, unquote. Uh, and there were, there were people who made it, who weren't gentlemen, Captain Cook, for example, unlike most of the Royal Navy didn't like Captain Cook. Uh, so it, it was sort of a snobby institution. And yeah, you had to have, you had to have a certain amount of money to be able to afford to become a member of the Royal Navy. Was there any reference to the Southern Lights in the records? The Aurora, meaning the Aurora, presumably. Uh, no, uh, none that I remember. Okay. And who funded this expedition? Oh. I, I, well, I, I can say that we had one night of clear skies when we were in Antarctica. And I went out on the deck hoping to, one, see the Northern Lights, and two, be able to photograph the the southern sky, and, and, and the boat had so many lights on that you couldn't, you couldn't see anything but the, the boat lights. So we, we wouldn't have had a chance to see the northern lights anyway if they, if they had shown, which was disappointing. Okay. And who funded this expedition? Well, you have three boats. One's named the James Caird. He uh, was a big uh, tobacco magnet. He fought a guy named Dudley Docker and uh, Helen Stancom Wills put up a big portion of the money. The expedition wasn't fully funded and there will be lots of problems because of that. We'll discuss a little, a couple of those problems next time. Uh, but he got big sponsors and then individual sponsors kicked in money. The Royal Geographic Society, who really didn't like Shackleton that much, particularly after Scott died, Scott and Shackleton were uh, uh, and they preferred Scott, the great hero who did all the stupid stuff as opposed to Shackleton who refused to kill himself by not going all the way to the pole, uh, they gave a thousand pounds. So there were, there, were, there were monies that trickled in as well, but none of them covered the full expense of the expedition. And at the end of the expedition, Shackleton was fundamentally broke. How old was Shackleton during this expedition? He was born in 1874. So 26 plus 14 is 40. And how far is Shackleton's base camp from Admiral Byrd's? Uh, I, I don't know that. Shackleton, keep in mind, uh, well, Shackleton's, uh, for this purpose of this expedition, Shackleton didn't have a base camp. So the answer is it didn't exist. Shackleton, when he went in 1908, 1909, used the same staging area uh, McMurdo Sound in the Ross Sea to go there. So it was probably, I think it's probably relatively close to where Bird was, but I don't remember, when I looked at Bird, I don't remember exactly where he plunked down. But the American, the main American base is McMurdo Sound. Uh, so I'm guessing it was around there. Okay, great. Um, so there's one last question, which I will cover, and that is where can I get a recording of this presentation? And uh, the link to the recording of the presentation will be sent to everyone who registered for the, uh, the lecture this evening, and it will be on the Walnut Creek Library Foundation's YouTube page. So that's it for our questions, Mark. Thank you so much, and thank you all for joining us this evening. If you enjoyed tonight's program and look forward to more, 
we urge you to make a contribution to the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. It's easy to do. Just go to our website, www.wclibrary.org and click on the green donate button at the top of the screen. We've also added the link into the chat box for your convenience. Every dollar counts. In fact, two of my fellow foundation board members, Kathy Hicks and Peter Magnani, have agreed to match the donations we receive tonight and tomorrow up to $500. So any money you contribute will be doubled. You can also sign up on our website to receive our biweekly e-newsletter to keep up to date on all of the programs and activities available from our Walnut Creek libraries. Thank you again for attending this evening. We'll see you back here tomorrow night at seven o'clock for part two. Have a great evening.